Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. There you go. That's a better response. Uh, my name is Monica Lahi. I work in the office of Congressman Paul Tonko. First off, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to spend this time uh, at this town hall and the climate provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Uh, I'm here just to present a couple of housekeeping uh, notes and points. Firstly, there's restrooms. If you exit through where you came in from and take a right, there's a couple of restrooms there, just in case you need them. Uh, we have an emergency exit on both sides of the other side of this room uh, in the event that it's needed. Uh, and lastly, I just want to spend 30 seconds just going over the format of tonight's event. Uh, it is um, an inform informational session slash town hall where um, the congressman, Julie Tai, uh, from the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund, will present information relating to the Inflation Reduction Act, after which will be followed by uh, a question and answer session, which will be topical in nature. Uh, if you have questions or concerns or feedback which are not uh, in line with the topic tonight, please feel free to reach out to our office. We want to make sure we give you a thoughtful response to whatever uh, inquiry that you have. Uh, with that said, please join me in introducing the United States Representative for the 20th Congressional District of New York, Congressman Paul Danko. Uh, thank you, Mike, and uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, for, I think, an important discussion. Um, I do want to thank the Albany, Albany Library for their outstanding cooperation and help in hosting us this evening. So to the entire crew at the Albany Library, thank you for your uh, your help and your uh, uh, just great spirit to uh, make certain that uh, we had this space available. And also wanting to thank Julie because uh, we've known each other a very long time. It goes back to my early days in the State Assembly and our offices were across the hall. It was an NCON office and an energy office and uh, we worked uh, in a very strong collaborative back then and continue that now as Julie uh, practices her leadership role through the New York League of Conservation Voters. And so thank you again for your assistance in uh, putting together the information for this evening. And uh, to Matt also from, uh, where are you Matt? Are you in the room somewhere? From our, <laughs> thank you for your work with the, uh, the League of Conservation Voters for addressing federal policy and the entire team at the uh, L LCB uh, for your outstanding uh, passion on behalf of an important issue. So I thank you all for attending this evening. You know, there have been many cornerstone measures that have been part of the 117th session of Congress, which covered calendar years 21 and 22. And uh, tremendously successful. I credit the, uh, the President and his administration and the uh, congressional colleagues that, uh, with whom I serve for that outstanding track record. And uh, there was everything from the Safer Communities Act that was one of the first speaking to uh, gun safety um, uh, activities and transformations, uh, reforms, to the uh, American Rescue Plan, which enabled us to come back stronger from COVID and to allow for local decisions to be made out of best um, springboard, the comeback for the local regional economies in our country. And then, of course, there was the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the Chips and Science Act, and, of course, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, our discussion this evening will focus on that and primarily the environmental energy aspects of the IRA. But a lot of legislation that was advanced that is historic in its dimensions and uh, transformational in its, uh, in its policies and principles. And I think for that, we're very thankful that uh, through the halls of Congress, we were able to participate with the administration and get that work done. And so as we transition, into this clean energy and precision and uh, uh, innovation economy, it's important for us to uh, have the tools and the toolkit, so to speak. And this is really transformational. I hear it when I go around the district. I hear it when I go around the state or in DC with folks who come in from all sections of the country to uh, speak their concerns for various issues and their proposed solutions. And everyone talks about not just the resources made available in these bills, but the policy initiatives that are woven into the various aspects of the bill so that they provide for a great connection to that transformation, that innovation that will allow for us to move into a, an eclipsing, if you will, of a new sort of workplace situation where we'll not only provide jobs and sound paying jobs that are union based, but also provide for sound stewardship of our nation and the world's environment. So, with that being said, 
It's a great opportunity this evening for all of us to inform one another, educate and advocate, um, and support a climate-friendly, clean energy transition in our capital region and our state of New York. And it's also a way to celebrate an anniversary because this evening, today, marks the one-year anniversary of the enactment of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is already creating tens of thousands of jobs and enabling billions of dollars of clean energy investments to happen uh, across our country. Today will be an opportunity. Thank you. Today will be an opportunity to discuss some of the major tax and rebate provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act. But before we get into the details, I thought it might be helpful to provide a little background on the climate progress that was achieved last year uh, in Congress. The 117th Congress, which covered, as I indicated, the 21-22 calendar years, has also been referenced as the most productive Congress since the 1960s. And I'll also give a highlight. President Biden had a certain challenge here because he had a dead even count in the Senate and a very slight majority in the House unlike in the 60s when it was a much stronger outcome. So hats off to that kind of leadership. And I think in, that, in this case of the 117th Congress, it was truly a reflection of experience, of connections with the various forces and programs and colleagues that built partnerships and relationships that got these things done and earned that designation of most productive. First, the bipartisan infrastructure law included billions of dollars to strengthen our electric grid, build a national network of EV charging stations, enable schools and transit agencies to purchase electric buses, and many more critical investments. That funding is already going out to communities, to schools across our great land. Second, we passed the Chips and Science Act, which is going to make historic investments, investments in research, in development, and manufacturing to promote American global economic competitiveness. It will support the development of critical and strategic industries, such as semiconductors, which are essential to not only our computers and phones, but clean energy technologies like electric vehicles and solar panels. Today, I had the great opportunity to host our trade administrator, Kathleen Chi Tai, for a visit to the region to go to Global and just see the role they're playing in a global economy with global demand for chips. So a great opportunity for us to land those kinds of investments right here in our technically savvy region of the capital region. And finally, exactly one year ago today, the Inflation Reduction Act was enacted, which included $370 billion over the next decade to deploy clean energy and address environmental injustices. And this number could be even higher if individuals and businesses take full advantage of all of the incentives given and provided for in that law. The IRA includes long-term extensions of key tax credits for wind, for solar, for electric vehicles. It makes major investments in American manufacturing, and it has bonuses for clean energy projects that use high labor standards. These are the types of policy changes that will not only help us address climate change, but will reshape our economy so that American clean energy industries are high-quality job creators for decades to come. It has been estimated that the IRA will result in greenhouse gas emission reductions of 40% by 2030. This is truly amazing, but our work is far from done. Decisions we are making today will determine whether we succeed or fail in achieving net zero emissions by no later than 2050. For example, new cars still, uh, can still be on the road in some 20 or 30 years from now. So our long-term decarbonization successes require us to get to work today. First, we need to make certain that the IRA is being implemented and implemented well. This has been a top priority of mine this year, keeping the Biden administration on track as it develops the rules for these new programs and incentives. Second, we are going to need additional policies. 40% climate pollution reduction is huge, but it is short of the Biden administration's commitment to some 50 to 52% by 2030. State, local, and private sector commitments may help fill that gap, but we are probably going to need to do more to ensure that we do indeed hit the target. Obviously, during this time of a divided Congress, House Democrats are playing defense. House Republicans have voted on several occasions to repeal many sections of the IRA, 
including tax credits. But regardless, it is clear that the House is unlikely to pass many explicitly pro-clean energy policies until after the next election. And of course, the Biden administration can still act. They are proposing new pollution standards on cars and power plants that will indeed help make the most of the tax credits for clean energy and electric vehicles that abound in the IRA. And the Inflation Reduction Act has made it possible for us to pursue even more ambitious environmental protections on stronger legal footing. We do need to make certain that the Biden administration takes advantage of this given moment. And finally, we need to make certain that the public is aware of these incentives and encourage everyone to take advantage of them. With the IRA, Congress has done its part to help make clean energy decisions easier by making energy efficiency and electrification costs competitive. But at the end of the day, these incentives are still voluntary. People will need to choose more climate-friendly options. That is why sessions like these are so important. People have to be made aware that incentives are out there, that they're real, and they can result in major savings on our energy bills. The advocacy group Rewiring America found that those savings could be up to $1,800 annually for an average household. As you know, these individual tax credits and rebates are designed to promote energy efficiency and electrification. They cover residential equipment and appliances, such as, such as the installation of heat pumps, at-home EV chargers, and solar panels on our roofs. They also cover installation, high-performing windows, electric bulb upgrades, and wiring, and other elements of home <coughs> retrofits. Not only will these replacements reduce greenhouse gas pollution, but they will save people money on their utility and fuel bills. And as an added benefit, improving ventilation and removing traditional air pollution from your home can also improve health outcomes and reduce rates of childhood asthma, for example. If all goes according to plan, most of the IRA credits will be in place at least through 2030. People can take their time. Many of these incentives are unique credits that could be used separately and, of course, over the years. But it is important that people know what is available, since we often replace our boilers, our furnaces, and our water heaters after they break. And in those emergency situations, you may opt for the easiest replacement, which may not be to switch to electric. And as more people know what incentives they are entitled to, hopefully more and more local contractors will offer these products in the region on demand. Because at the moment there is some uncertainty and confusion about who is eligible for each credit, which specific products and brands qualify, and when these credits and rebates will be available to be claimed. Trying to decipher IRS guidelines about tax credits is complicated material. This will take some time and not all the details are worked out yet. So for tax credits, some information has already been released and more should be coming in the very near future. For debate, for rebates, excuse me, the Department of Energy has just released some initial guidance, but New York will now need to apply for that funding and establish its own given program. It may take until the end of this calendar year for that to happen. And I'm really hoping the administration will implement these credits in a way that happens to be consumer friendly so that people are able to take full advantage of them. But I know there will be a lot of questions and my office will do our best to help our given constituency. But I should be clear, we are not tax professionals. So ultimately, people may need to rely on the many different resources being developed by organizations that do have more expertise uh, with the uh, tax code. So again, I want to express my gratitude to all for coming here this evening. Um, I should make mention too that the IRA, in my opinion, will go a long way to make certain that we modernize our manufacturing, make it more efficient, and certainly as an outcome, address the critical supply side shortage that became so apparent during the COVID era. And so there's a lot of good that can potentially flow from the IRA. And again, thank you to Julie and the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund for collaborating with today's event. These are the types of initial public settings that provide for awareness and education, efforts that I think can make a big difference. And I hope people will be interested enough to do some follow-up research and determine which of these incentives are the best for you. Because again, these incentives are so important. They are the linchpin to our national effort to reduce fossil fuel use and combat the worst consequences of climate change, which have become more and more apparent as we turn on our TV sets and witness national news. 
It is on all of us to be conscientious consumers, to help contribute to achieving our climate goals. And with that, I again thank you and look forward to tonight's discussion. And with that, let me introduce Julie uh, T, T uh, Ty, Julie Ty, for uh, as president of New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund to give us a presentation with more information just to relate how the IRA can benefit you and your household. So Julie, if you would, please. Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing today? It's nice that it's not, I'm good right now, I think. Uh, it's nice that it's not 800,000% humidity today. I appreciate that. Um, I'm Julie Tai. I'm president of the New York League of Conservation Voters and the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. We are a statewide environmental advocacy organization that also has this education fund that serves to educate, engage, and empower New Yorkers to be effective advocates for the environment. And we do that through civic engagement through forums like these where we talk about policy issues uh, and through candidate forums so that we can hear where candidates stand on the issues. Uh, for example, we're going to be holding a candidate forum in Troy for the mayor's race uh, in September. So if you're interested in that, get more. you can sign up for information in the back. Um, I live in New York City now, but I lived in Center Square right here on Hudson Avenue for more than 20 years. Um, so it's nice to be back in my old neighborhood. Uh, my staffer, who lives in Saratoga County, was like, well, you know that road by the University Club? And I was like, Dove Street? <laughs> I like, I lived off of Dove Street for, for many years of my life, so it's nice to be back. Um, and with Paul Tonko in particular, who has been such a champion for energy and the environment for his entire career through the assembly, through NYSERDA, through his time in Congress. Um, we are so lucky to be represented by him. Um, and we're so appreciative for your dedication to the environment and advancing sustainable energy policies. Um, and, and I think the congressman really said it well. Um, we're here tonight to talk about what the federal government has done, what Congress has done to act on climate. But I see, looking around the room, I see colleagues who are at EPA, I see colleagues who are working with me at the Department of Environments and Conservation, I see friends who worked at NYSERDA, the state's energy uh, organization, the state legislature, uh, local government, it takes everybody. And we are fortunate that we live in a state that is not in climate denial, it is in climate action mode. And really tonight we wanna to talk about how what Congress has done is going to help the state of New York and people in New York act on climate change, that we're moving beyond just talking about climate change and actually taking action to address it um, in a way that's going to be beneficial for, for homeowners, for consumers, for renters, for people. Um, you know, we, we are very fortunate. I'm glad to be here today. A year ago today, I was in Washington, D.C. I had the fortune of being invited to the White House, although I was on that long, I was not anywhere near Joe Biden, uh, when, they, when the president signed uh, the bill into law, and it was really a momentous day. We, um, we had a lot of ups and downs. Uh, it seemed that at one point in time that um, a senator from a uh, coal state was going to prevent us from taking action. Um, I, was, I was questioning whether or not our great senator was going to be um, undermined by this senator from this coal state, and uh, he, he pulled the rabbit out of a hat, I think, and uh, really pulled through, and we applaud Congressman Tonko and Senator Schumer and all of the House and Senate counterparts who never gave up on this legislation, even when it seemed like all hope was lost. Um, because of that, we're able to celebrate the biggest, boldest action and investment our, our nation, and I think anywhere in the world, has ever made in climate change. Um, by incentivizing the way people and businesses you know, make choices and they can make greener choices by making them more affordable and making them more knowledgeable and making them more available, um, which is usually a problem. Uh, the IRA is paving the way towards a cleaner, more resilient future and demonstrating that environmental policy can be a win-win both for our wallets and for the planet. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of these, these benefits and the, the, the consumer opportunities available from, from these incentives. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight because we need people like you to learn about these benefits and then bring them back to your friends and your neighbors so that they know what's out there and available for them so that they can take advantage of that. So I just want to hearken in on that. Um, I hope you find the information we present useful um, and actionable. Um, we do have guides at the back if you haven't had a chance to collect one. We, uh, we have made them available in Spanish, we just haven't had them printed yet. 
um, and we're going to be updating them when, as the congressman indicated, when we get updates from, from the federal government, when the IRS provides more guidance. So there'll be updates available on our website, which is www.nylcvef.org. Um, and but they're available at the back table. So really, really high level, just to show you where we are already, uh, the IRA, and I'm happy to talk an Irish joke about that later, um, you know, we've already seen benefits here in New York, right? We have $11.7 billion in public infrastructure and clean energy investments that are being made in the state of New York from both the IRA and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which is also called the IIJA, because these are terrible acronyms. That's okay. Uh, we've already seen 4,300 jobs in clean energy for, that are resulting from this. $317 million in home energy rebates uh, for weatherizing our homes and replacing old appliances mm -hmm. with more efficient models. Private companies have announced $44 billion of investments in industries like semiconductors and electronics. I know you were talking about global uh, earlier that we know is, is such an important factor and anyone who's been to Saratoga knows that's what a difference it has made for the economy um, in the capital region. But it's a 44, $41 billion investment in New York State from semiconductors and electronics. Um, EVs and batteries, uh, $689 million. Clean energy, $2 billion. Uh, Biomanufacturing, $470 million. Um, you know, there is about a billion dollars that's coming from global foundries in Saratoga County with 1,000 jobs associated with it. That's a real, tangible you know, economic benefit. Um, not so far in Kingston, there's a new company called Zinc 8 that's making batteries. Uh, they, they're planning on investing $68 million over five years. Uh, they're going to have 500 jobs, and they're going to be getting uh, local tax credits from the state as well. Um, and offshore wind, which I feels far away from Albany, since we're not so offshore, we're not putting wind turbines in the Hudson River, um, or the Mohawk for that matter. Um, but we are going to see real benefits with that. There are, there are components that are made up here. There are manufacturing jobs that are coming to this area specifically to help with offshore wind. And that is a place where New York is really going to be a national leader because of our, our robust uh, wind resources that are available. Um, and this year, later this year, we're going to have the first offshore wind project called South Fork Wind is going to come online. So we're gonna move from, again, from talking about climate action and really moving into that. That will allow us to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. So specifically on the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and, and Congressman Tonko talked about this, but this is really, it's a major historic win. It's a huge clean energy plan. Um, you know, it covers a lot of things, right? There are, there are funds and actions available, incentives available for clean energy, for clean transportation, for making uh, energy efficiency improvements to our buildings, the way we're heating and cooling our homes. Uh, we, can, we can be investing in public lands and protecting our water supplies. Um, clean manufacturing, we, talk, we touched on that already, not just for, um, for semiconductors and things like that, but also for, for solar panels, for EV charging infrastructure, for batteries, uh, for um, the equipment, for the blades, for the, uh, for the wind turbines. Um, we're going to be investing in healthy communities. We're going to be investing in, in climate smart agriculture, which we know is such an important part of the economy in upstate New York. Um, we, as, as Congressman mentioned, uh, it, it is expected that this would reduce that the investments from the Inflation Reduction Act will result in a 40% reduction in climate pollution by 2030. That is a short way away. <laughs> Here we are in August of 2023 having just witnessed the apocalyptic orange skies. Um, I don't know how bad they were in Albany, but I know in New York City they were, they were pretty darn scary. It was like you were in a sepia movie. Um, but that is you know, expected to be about a gigaton uh, reduction in climate pollution. Um, as, as he mentioned, there's gonna be a reduction in energy costs for everyone, um, and expected to be up to $1,800 per household when you're using electrification opportunities. So those are like real benefits that you can take home every year. Um, we know that at least 40% of these, these funds are to be invested in disadvantaged communities. There are people who are on the front lines who have been in neighborhoods that have been subject to pollution, who, who don't have as much money as others do, who need to get benefits first um, and make sure that we're getting low people of low wealth um, who've been harmed by fossil fuels to get the opportunity to get more investments. 
Um, we're expecting that this will create nine million new jobs. Um, that is a lot of jobs that we're talking about adding to the economy. That's not just, that's just national, this is not in New York State. That would be an awful lot of jobs for a state of 19, 19 million people. Um, but it is really significant on a national scale. Um, and it's expected that would avert about 3,900 premature deaths from pollution, uh, and that's 100,000 asthma attacks yearly by 2030. Um, that is something that is really important. It's not just about the kids who have those asthma attacks, which is the number one cause of school absenteeism, but it's also about the lost time that the, that your, the parents have in bringing their kids to, to the emergency room, uh, to the doctors, and uh, the, the challenges that that causes. Um, so those are real public health benefits that are associated with this. Um, this would put us on a trajectory uh, with state actions and with the potential for additional uh, future federal policy to reduce 50% uh, emissions by 2030, which is what President Biden's goal was when uh, he came into office. And when he started this, when it was called something else, I'm forgetting now because of the, we had so many different names to work Oh yes, yeah, Build Back Better. There we go. Build Back Better. A little less Irish than the IRA. <laughs> but it's been such a good opportunity to practice the broke. Um, so clean energy, uh, a lot of the clean energy benefits are gonna be for companies, uh, less so for individuals. There are, there are benefits for individuals as well, but we have a 10 year extension of the 30% tax credits for clean renewable energy, for energy storage, and for direct pay for nonprofits and government entities. So what does direct pay mean, right? Normally, right, you, to go to tax credit, you have to have to pay taxes in the first place, right? So there are some entities like the government that doesn't pay taxes, right? So the state of New York couldn't get a benefit from that. The downstate, we talk a lot about the, the MTA who runs the subways and the buses. They didn't apply for some of these things. It wasn't cost effective for them because they couldn't get tax credits. Direct pay allows for companies or individuals or nonprofits who don't pay taxes to be able to get benefits by getting uh, basically a rebate, but they're calling it direct pay um, from this. So that will allow them to take advantage of these clean energy uh, credits. There's an additional 10% 10 per, uh, 10 for new renewable energy and energy storage projects that are in low income communities. Again, trying to bring benefits to communities that have been subject to fossil fuel pollution um, and to help bring jobs that go with that. Um, there is a $27 billion greenhouse gas reduction fund that's going to capital, you know, catalyze private investment in clean energy, but it's also going to be making sure that there's funding available for the state to get more solar, for example. Like I know NYSERDA has applied for $400 million uh, from the federal government from this pot of money to help make solar more available within the state, and local governments are eligible to apply for that as well. So there's a lot of different pots that are gonna come from this greenhouse gas reduction fund. Um, transportation, lots of talk about electric vehicles. The state of New York requires that only electric vehicles be sold starting in 2035. Um, I myself have, have purchased an electric vehicle, um, partially so I can talk about it from a real life perspective and not just talk about it as like a proselytizer. Um, but now there's new tax credits. Uh, there are tax credits of up to $7,500. They are income limited. Uh, and there are restrictions on, uh, on where some of the components come from because they're trying to make sure that more of the batteries are being made in America. Um, so there are, there are, there's information available about that now, but you can get a tax credit of up to $7,500 for an electric car, uh, which can help bring the cost down of purchasing electric vehicles in the first place. In addition, the state of New York has up to $2,000 in rebates that you can add on to that. So you would be getting a total of $9,500 off of that. Um, and there's also funds for the first time, and I'm gonna skip over that middle bullet. There's for the first time, there's a credit for used, used electric vehicles, right? There are a lot of people who do not buy uh, brand new cars. I myself, the first time I bought a new car was this electric car that I bought last year um, and I'm, in my 40s, right? So there are a lot of people who are not buying a brand new car. Um, so this will make more EVs available to lower income people who are more likely to buy a used car. Um, that's really exciting. Um, it's, it was challenging to, to work on, but I think it's something that's really important. Um, something that we, the league, have advocated for for a very long time is uh, electric school buses. Um, many of you probably don't know this, but last year as part of the state budget, the governor and legislature agreed to a law that requires all school buses to be electric by 2035. Um, as I mentioned before, 
Absenteeism for students is caused first and foremost by asthma, and certainly diesel school buses are a contributor to that. Um, there's funding for up to 30% of the cost of electric school buses as part of this. Um, we got a, a first round of grants, uh, actually from the bipartisan infrastructure law last year, uh, where the state of New York got funding for 184 school buses across the state. Um, so it's a, it's a start. We have an astonishing 50,000 school buses here in the state of New York. So it's gonna take a little time for us to reach all of them, uh, but this is a, a, certainly a way we wanna make sure that school districts are taking advantage of the grant funding that's available. Um, and if you are interested in that, please see us. We have people who are much more in the details than I am on that. Um, as well, there's funding available, not just for EVs, but also for EV infrastructure, for charging infrastructure, for you to be able to charge at home. Um, so having those tax credits up to $1,000 for a home EV charger will help reduce the cost of getting an EV charger at home, which if you do that, will save you a lot more money than buying gas, especially upstate where electricity is relatively cheap. Um, there's two point, uh, there's $2 billion available in grants to convert manufacturing facilities to, uh, to advance EVs, so that we're making sure that we're transitioning uh, not just to brand new car companies, but also making sure that existing car companies can make those vehicles and keep the jobs so that we have the workers continuing to do that work. Um, there is a healthy communities program. So there's $333 million for air quality <coughs> monitoring in environmental justice communities, like the South End of Albany, for example. Uh, there's a $3 billion environmental and climate justice block grant program. It's gonna be divvied up through, uh, through various um, organizations. There's putting back on the, on the, on the rolls uh, a tax on oil companies to pay for the federal Superfund program. It's gonna be about $10.5 billion. Um, there's $3 billion in funding for revitalizing communities who've been damaged by uh, splitting of highways, splitting communities. I don't know that 787 counts for that, but if, for those of you familiar with Syracuse, they're, they're looking at this pot of funding for helping with I-81, which has broken up uh, a, a community of color in that, in that neighborhood. Um, and they're looking at this for um, reconnecting the Bronx where the Cross Bronx Expressway cuts right through, uh, through some neighborhoods. Um, and again, there's a commitment that the federal government has made that 40% of the funds go to disadvantaged communities. Um, for clean manufacturing, there's you know, tax incentives for, for clean energy. Um, there's two different programs. Um, Micron is, is a, was a big announcement again in Syracuse. They're going to bring 50,000 jobs to make to make uh, chips here in, in New York, um, which, as we all know, 50,000 jobs in Syracuse, New York, is an awful lot of jobs. Uh, 50,000 jobs anywhere in New York is an awful lot of jobs. Um, but there's funds that are going to help to advance that, as well as incentives for, for moving the federal fleet to clean vehicles, uh, making sure that there's clear labeling on products so we know. Uh, what's in them, a federal buy clean program so that there's procurement changes, um, as well as investments of $6 billion for helping to move uh, energy intensive industries. Think about like uh, aluminum or steel manufacturing. We wanna make sure they have an opportunity to transition to something that's cleaner and greener without losing the jobs associated with that. So we're trying to make sure that there's funds available for these energy intensive uh, manufacturing facilities to, to reduce pollution associated with them. Um, for buildings, so there's a, an expansion of tax credits that's available for both commercial and residential buildings uh, to do energy efficiency upgrades uh, and to do pu public building upgrades. So think about putting on um, more efficient uh, light bulbs, uh, putting in new upgraded electrical systems, adding in more um, uh, more insulation, things like that, will make your home much more energy efficient. Uh, there's new tax credits available for that. Again, there's a billion dollars in, in funds available for disadvantaged communities uh, to help move away from fossil fuels, uh, and a billion dollars to make affordable housing more water and energy <coughs> efficient, because very often they are not, um, and making them more resilient to climate change, as well as funding of at least $200 million for energy efficient job training and $9 billion for residential energy efficiency projects. So this is making sure that people can come in and do that work in your homes and make them more energy efficient and associate them with a bunch of rebates that are available for buildings and appliance, appliance electrification. Um, there's funding for wildfire prevention and urban forestry. I think we're all familiar with the impacts of, uh, of, for, of wildfires right now. 
Obviously, we haven't had so many here in New York. It's been a fairly rainy summer, I would say. Um, but certainly, we've felt the, the, the impacts associated with the, the wildfires in Canada, and we've sent people to other states and other, you know, to Canada to help fight those wildfires. So trying to do that more, more locally. Urban forestry is important for two reasons. One is, I'm sure many of your communities, you've seen trees that had to be removed because of invasive species, um, like the Asian longhorn beetle or the emerald ash borer, um, but also because tree, communities that have uh, more tree cover are often cooler uh, and they're better, they have better air quality. So we, there was a study in the New York Times that showed that neighborhood that had a lot of trees could be as much as nine degrees cooler than neighborhoods that did not. And very often, because of some historical policies, those are in communities that are people of color or people who are low income who can least afford to buy air conditioning and to pay for the electricity associated with that. So trees really are a um, really big part of the answer. <laughs> um, there's also um, funds for uh, doing coastal restoration projects um, where we're making sure that we're protecting our communities from the impacts of sea level rise and storm surge um, as well as funding for the National Park Service. Um, so why should you move to energy efficiency appliances? So it's gonna result in cleaner air from less pollution. It's gonna use less energy, which means it's gonna save you money, uh, which I think everyone can relate to, no matter your political stripe. Um, and we can get these new tax incentives and rebates that will make sure that they're cheaper for you to make that transition. I agree, it's always like when, you're, when it's in the middle of the winter is when you need the furnace. Um, but we know that there's new opportunities that can do this much more efficiently. That will be a long, a long term investment. Um, there's a calculator that was put together by uh, the organization that the congressman mentioned before called Rewiring America, uh, where you can calculate how much money you could save uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, you can put in information about what kind of tax, uh, whether you rent or your own, how you file your taxes, the size of your household, what your income is for the household, and where you are. So this is uh, this is a looking at Schenectady, um, right? Where you could potentially save as much as fourteen thousand dollars up front because you could get a reduction of the cost of certain um, products like energy efficient refri refrigerators or uh, heat pumps to heat your home or heat and cool your home. Uh, you can get up to 50% of that cost off of that. Uh, you can get tax credits of another 60, almost $6,500, and you're gonna save money from using these energy efficiency appliances of up to $1,100 a year. Um, so that means the total incentives that you could get from the Inflation Reduction Act is $20,000, right? So that is a very significant benefit. Obviously, that's you have to take advantage of a lot of different things to do that, but that is how much you could potentially get um, for your household of three uh, in Schenectady with that making $65,000 so that you can benefit from, from these programs. Um, and there's a way for you to go on, again, the Rewiring America website and you can, you can put in this information and figure out for yourself what you would potentially be eligible for. Um, again, we are similarly non-tax professionals, um, but this is a, an estimate that is out there. Um, you know, there's a tax credits versus rebates, right? Basically, tax credits are something that you file for once a year when you file your taxes. Uh, rebates are something that you can get whether or not you owe any taxes, and very often they'll, they could happen at the point of sale, right? So you don't have to you know, file for a tax credit to get, um, uh, let's use the example that we put on the slideshow, right? So if you buy an electric car, right, the, to get the $7,500 tax credit, you're gonna file that with your taxes in April or May or whenever you file your taxes. Um, but if you're going to get the nice sort of rebate associated with that, that happens at the car dealership, right? So that comes right off the top. You're not paying for it, you're not financing it. It happens, the dealer manages that for you, whereas you, you'll have to file to get that $7,500 tax credit back. Um, a, your, a lot of the eligibility for the programs uh, is based on your local uh, median income. So you cannot say it's you know one particular thing for everywhere in the state. It is really meant to be uh, a range based on what what's, uh, prices are, are in your neighborhood, in your community. So using Schenectady as an example, um, the median income there is $113,000. Uh, 
Um, that's households with incomes who are less than $90,000 can get 100% of certain costs covered. So that, that's the federal government is paying all of it. Um, if you're between 90 and $170,000 basically, you can get up to 50% of those costs covered. So it is, it is income based how much money you're eligible for so that people who are, have less money are able to get more support. Um, right now for cars, uh, again for EVs under the current IRS rules, uh, the car itself has to have an MS, M MRSP, MSRP of, thank you, I'm not a car person yet, um, hence why my first car for slasher that I bought. Um, it has to be under $55,000. Um, there's a little bit higher of a range if you're buying an SUV, van, or a pickup, it has to be under $80,000 depending on the model. But the, again, there's an income cap, so if you're buying it individually, it's, uh, the cap is $150,000. Uh, it's $225,000 for heads of household, and it's $300,000 for joint filers. So it's, it's not uh, an unreasonably low cap, um, as far as that goes, but it is capped so that uh, higher income earners are not going to be eligible for, for this tax credit in particular. Um, there's going to be uh, some new credits applying uh, starting next year, um, and where, where the car is made and its components are made will, will determine eligibility. Uh, the congressman mentioned before, there's some incentives to if a car is made with union labor, for example, uh, to help encourage use of um, the prevailing wages. Um, so there's a bunch of tax credits that are available. Um, I won't, I can, I can, I can read them all if you want me to, but we have this, we can link it, uh, the slideshow available. Um, these are all the tax credits that are available now and how much there can be. So battery storage and geothermal heating, um, new electric vehicles, uh, solar rooftop installation, um, heat pumps for air conditioning and heating your homes, uh, heat pumps for your water uh, heater, things like that, doing weatherization. Um, electrical panel upgrades, which are sometimes needed for some of the other things you might want to change. For example, if you want to put in a new EV charger, you may need to upgrade your electrical panel in order to do that. I know many of the houses here in the capital region are pretty old. Uh, my house, I had one of those plaques, was built in 1853. Um, so I know that the, a lot of these upgrades need to be done in order for people to be able to take advantage of adding more electrical appliances. Um, some of the ones that we don't yet have all the information for are gonna come out later this year. As I mentioned, we're gonna update our guide and make information available on our website, but we don't have it yet for heat pump air conditioners and heaters, uh, ele more electrical panel work, efficiency rebates, electrical wiring, um, weatherization, things like that. The heat pump, uh, clothes dryers, um, and induction stoves. Um, so they're very, very, more information is coming. Um, it takes a lot of time to put out all this guidance for the very, very massive uh, piece of legislation. Um, some of the things that the state of New York is adding to those uh, available opportunities, um, and there's a New York State Clean Heat Program, which provides incentives to invest in more energy efficient appliances, which will, again will save you money. Um, there is the Assisted Home Energy Home Performance with Energy Star program that provides a discount of up to $5,000 um, for income qualified individuals. Um, there's a heat pump program to make heat pumps more affordable, um, offering uh, $1,000 to $4,000 incentives um, to reduce you know, ceiling and insulation packages, depending on the types of improvements that you're proposing to make to your home. Um, not for up here. We should update this because ConEd does not qualify here, so we'll skip that one. Um, but if you're switching to geothermal, if you're in NYSEG, I don't know if National Grid is doing this. Probably most of you are National Grid, right? Okay. Um, but there are some there are some items. But there is a tax credit of five thousand dollars that is actually we did that last year, Kevin. Yes, just last year. Um, if you do, if you switch to geothermal, then there's a, a five thousand dollar tax credit for you to do that. Uh, from the state of New York. Um, and I think that's what I have for you. So there's a lot. I haven't covered everything because there's so many programs uh, available, but it's why we put together the guides that are available in the back. And I think uh, I think we're open to ask, answering some questions, which I'm also gonna ask Matt Salton from my office to come up here because he's done way more of these programs than I have. All right, thank you.
So a whole lot of information to absorb, but um, it begins with dialogue and conversation. And obviously there are websites that you can go to and uh, you know our office is always anxious to take any concerns you have and respond to them in a way that will either direct you to the source or we'll get information for you and share it with you. But um, great opportunities that uh, I think you need to uh, uh, embrace so that um, you know we can all play a part in responding to some very robust goals, but goals that really address not only our given generation, but those that will follow us.